Welcome to One Brush Stroke at a Time. I'm Jenny Fister, and I will be leading you through an amazing Bible study for the next half hour. I'm going to be doing a study today out of my, one of my books. Uh, is, I am having four devotionals that are being published, and they should be out sometime the last of June, the, the first of July. And I'm going to be teaching out for the next few weeks out of those books, out of those devotions. Today I'm going to do a study called the Phylactery Factory. <laughs> now, Phylactery, uh, P-H-Y-L, that's Phylactery Factory. Um, a phylactery is um, a little leather case that God tells the Israelites or the Jews to wear in a certain place at a certain time filled with a certain thing and we'll get there but I want to take you back to the book of Exodus for this study Exodus is not only a book it's a promise it's a promise from the Lord to the nation of Israel that he is going to set up a kingdom through them on this earth the children of Israel have just come through the ten plagues, the, the manifestation of God's power, of his presence, of his authority. They've come through the ten plagues, through the, dead, uh, the Red Sea parting, and they're about to enter the promised land. And God is about to set up his law, his government among the people on the earth. But it all begins with his word. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 9, this verse reads like this, So it shall be, and it shall serve as a sign to you that you put on your hand and as phylacteries on your forehead. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. What God directed Moses was to have the people of Israel fashion a phylactery, Again, a phylactery is a, a leather uh, boxes, just small little boxes. And in them, uh, they were to place four uh, specific scriptures that Jews still wear and have today. And they're to place them on their forehead by a leather strap that goes around their head and on their arm right near the elbow. The, the phylacteries were um, to be a sign of remembrance of God's word in their lives. They were filled with four very specific strips of paper that had these scriptures on them. The first scripture was Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And it says, it's the great, Hear, O Israel, the, the Lord thy God is one. And then it goes on to say, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That was the set of verses, that, the first strip. The second strip was Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21. And this is, if you obey my commandments, scripture, it's a verse of scripture, a, a, a group of scriptures about, if you obey my commandments, and if you would lay up these words upon your heart. That's the second uh, piece of paper in the phylactery. The third one was Exodus 13, verses 1 through 10. And this was the... Um, Revelation of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, how they were to eat unleavened bread for seven straight days, and those sets of scriptures are in the phylactery. And the final strip of paper, the final scripture, was Exodus 13, 11 through 16, and this was a rehearsal or a, a remembrance of the story of Moses bringing them out of Egypt, the children of Israel out of Egypt. And those are the four pieces of paper that are in this phylactery, this leather box that goes on your forehead by a leather cord and on your arm. They were to be held in place. They were to be worn all of the time. And they were there to serve as a reminder of how God wanted Israel to live by the word. We've kind of lost that today. We know the word. We speak the word. Of course, there are so many songs that sing the word, uh, so many um, posters that have the word. We see little pictures of them on Facebook and on uh, social media outlets. We see scripture all the time, but I wonder if we really have it fastened to our bodies, to our minds, to our souls, and to our spirits. I wonder if we really understand the necessity for having the word ever ready and ever present right before our eyes. 
We are a people of a new life with Him. The church has been sanctified. It's been set apart. And the Word must be a very present part of the modern-day church, of today's church. We are to speak the Word, walk the Word, study the Word, be the Word, wear the Word. Wait, wear the Word? We're supposed to wear the Word. Are we supposed to have phylacteries on our heads and our foreheads as we walk around in this world today? Are we supposed to have little boxes on our elbows? I don't believe that's what God meant. But we are to wear the Word all on us, all over us. We are to wear the Word on different parts of our lives, our, our bodies, our families. Well, let me show you. The fact is, scriptures tell us that we're supposed to put on the Word. Put on the Word. Well, how do we put on the Word? Do you wear a Bible over your head? Do you uh, put a scripture or necklace on? Well, we can do that. Do you have to wear t-shirts with scriptures? Let me show you some scriptures and talk about what it means to wear the Word, how we can become a phylactery factory, how we can wear His Word in every part of our lives in very simple, easy, beautiful ways. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8 says, we're to bind the Word, His Word, on our hands. Well, we put on the Word while we work. We use our hands to work. And God says to wear the Word on your hands. Well, how do I wear the Word on my hands? Well, I can wear the Word by being a worker of integrity, where I'm an honest laborer, where I work for what I'm earning. I don't steal. I don't um, waste time. I don't use time for my own uh, enjoyment and benefit, that I'm a good laborer, that my hands are constructively working for the one who employs me. Because remember, God says, do everything as unto the Lord. I'm really working for God. My employer or my boss is simply the vessel through which I'm accomplishing that. And so when God says, bind the words on your hands, what he's saying is, be a worker of integrity and honesty, loyalty. Be a worker whose hands um, represent God in every aspect, um, honest and true and good and a, a good word that I don't um, tear down my co-workers, that I'm an encourager in the workplace. God wants me to wear the word when I'm working. He wants me to be a, a beautiful sign, a phylactery of his word in the workplace. Exodus 13 verse 16 says we're supposed to wear the word on our foreheads. On our foreheads. That's when we think. We're supposed to have the word a, a part of us when we think. We are supposed to put on the helmet of salvation. We know that, that our thought, it says, what a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. We know that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Our, our, the way we think has a lot to do with the way that we act. And if I think about the Word, if the Word is in my mind, if I'm ever meditating on the Word, then what comes out of my heart and out of my mouth will be word-oriented. It may not be the scripture itself, but it would be um, a, a, a pure, good, wholesome thought. Pure things, good things, right things, beneficial things. That's what the Philippians says, to think on these things. And so when we wear the word on our foreheads, it's a reminder that we need to think in accordance with the word. If I think that I'm sick, and I don't think that I'm healed, I'll be sick. If I think that I can't do something, I won't be able to do it. But if I think with the word in mind, I can accomplish anything in Christ. Deuteronomy 11:18 says, To lay up these words of mine, that's God speaking, lay up these words of mine on your heart. We lay up his words when we love. In other words, I cannot love without the word being alive in me. That word is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so when I have the word in my heart, 
the psalmist says to hide the word in the heart that you might not sin against God. I need to hide that word. We need to hide the word in our hearts that we might not sin. And that when we love, we love beautifully and perfectly and wholly and rightly. Love with an agape love with which God loves us. So if I put the word on my hands when I work, I work with integrity and loyalty and perseverance and might. When I put the word in my mind, what I think I become, I think I'm his, I think I'm beautiful, I think I'm worthy, I think that I'm um, uh, the full of the fruit of the spirit, then what I think comes out of my heart and out of my mouth. And then if I bind them on my heart, I love the way God wants me to love. But it also says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 8, to bind these words on our souls. What's our soul? Well, our soul is the way that we think, feel, our emotions, our personalities, our desires, our passions, our zeal. All of that is in our soul. And God says, I need to bind the word on my soul. I don't think that really is any more true than when we need it today. We are soul-driven creatures. We go after passions and lusts and desires and what we want, and it's a me generation. God says it's not a me generation. It's a him generation. And so if I apply that word on my soul, then I begin to feel the way that God wants me to feel and think the way he wants me to think. It makes me act the way God wants me to act, and my personality be conformed into his image. When I begin to put the word on my soul, I begin to react the way that God wants me to react. I have a passion for good and right things. I leave behind those lustful uh, pleasures of youth that we are told to flee from because they no longer line up with what God wants for us. Exodus 13 verse 9 also says this, he will be a sign, It will be a sign that the Lord's law will be in your mouth. Ooh, we need the word when we speak. We need the word in our hands when we work. We need the word on our uh, foreheads when we think. We need the word on our hearts when we love. We need his word in our souls as we feel and act and react through the day. And then it says we need to have the word on our mouths, in our mouths as we speak. I can be hung by my tongue more often than I care to admit. I get hung up by my tongue more and more, um, less, well, let me say that more and more. I get hung up on my tongue less and less as I grow closer to Christ, but I'm finding more and more that my tongue really is. Remember the Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. I can speak a life into me or I can speak death into me. I can speak a life into a situation or I can speak death into a situation. James says it's like a rudder of a boat that can turn an entire boat or the tongue can be a flame that can just set ablaze everything before it. We need to have the word emblazoned on our tongue, implanted in our mouths so that what we say lines up with the word. What we speak will do will be what Ephesians 4.29 says, let no unwholesome communication proceed from your mouth unless it blesses edifies, encourages, and lifts up. If I can keep his word on my, in my mouth, then I can do what, what Ephesians 4 says to do. And I won't set the world ablaze with my tongue. I won't, won't devastate. I won't hurt somebody with my tongue. I will edify them, build them up, encourage them, and bless them. But not only are we supposed to have it in our mouths, we're also, Proverbs chapter verse chapter 3, verse 3 says this, Let not truth forsake you, bind them around your neck. Now, we wear necklaces for adornment. We wear neckties for adornment. The things around our neck have no real significance in our physical well-being, but it's how we look to other people or the way we think we look to other people. So when I am wearing the word around my neck, what God is saying is, you need to look like the word. You need to be adorned with the word. Now, John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word 
was God. In other words, God wants us to look like Jesus, to be adorned with his word, to look like him, that I'm a walking reflection of his holy word, so that when people need a word, I look like it. I look different than everyone else in the world. We look different from the world because we are adorned with his word. doesn't mean I have to advertise and put scriptures all over my body. Uh, it just means that we're supposed to reflect his word and to look like the word whom we know to be Jesus. So we have the word in our hands when we work. We have the word on our heads when we think. We have the word on our hearts when we love. We have it in our soul when we feel. We have it in our mouths when we speak. We have it adorned around our necks to reflect his beauty. But it also says that we are supposed to diligently teach the word and put it on to our children. To our offspring. That is in Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. We are supposed to be vessels of, of holiness, sanctified by the Word, having the Word implanted in us, just indwelling us, and that we then in turn pass it off to our children. We are supposed to adorn our children and fill our children's mouth, fill their minds, fill their hands, fill their hearts and their souls with the word. That is our our legacy to leave behind us. People are working to leave financial legacies behind them, inheritances for their children. But how great it would be to leave the blessing of a love for his word as a legacy to your children and your grandchildren. That's what it's all about, is leaving that legacy of the Word to our children. It also says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 9, that we're supposed to put the Word on our door frames and on our gates. In fact, it says this, you shall write them on the doorposts and on your gates. We are supposed to make our homes word homes. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We see that a lot. But serving the Lord and being people of his word can sometimes be two different things, vastly oppositional to one another. Because we can serve him in Sunday school or in the choirs or uh, teaching or preaching or being on TV or writing books. But if we don't have the word, if we're not living the word, what are we? We're just servers. We're just servants with no real reflection of his glory in us. If we put the word on our doorposts, that means every time you walk in, you see the word somewhere in action. I don't mean written. I mean in action. One of my closest friends has just put an addition on their house. And before they painted all the walls, they wrote scriptures all over the drywall. Just scriptures in the children's rooms and the children got to pick what they wanted what scriptures they wanted they put everywhere the house was being redone they put scriptures and then they painted over the scriptures but they were surrounded by the word those children go to bed every night believing they're surrounded by the word and then she put little scriptures on the walls like on the door frames above it or um, above a mirror in a room her home is the doorframe home, is the word home that God requires and commands us to do, to put the word on our homes, in our houses, in our living rooms. That means if the word is there, you will not want to, nor can you watch anything filthy and vile on TV because the word convicts you of that thing on TV. And how much better we would be if we didn't watch half the junk that's on TV. If we did not allow our children to watch what they watch or to uh, listen to the music that they listen to or play the video games that they play that are offensive to God because our word has our home has the word on its doorposts and within every room. The world needs to see the life-changing power of the Word of God. But Jesus warns us not to be like the Pharisees. Here's what he says in Matthew 23, verse 5. He says, Do not be like the Pharisees who want to be noticed by men. We don't want to be so word-dominated 
in order to be seen by men, to say, look how wonderful I am. I have the word in me. Or I can quote this word. Or I can speak forth this word. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want us to be pious and um, sanctimonious in our lives. There's a humility that comes with the word. It's a, it's a humbleness that goes, oh, the living word is inside of me. The living word has his dwelling within me. The living word is alive and active. That is so humbling. That's not a proud thing. That's recognizing that on my own, I'm nothing without the word. I am nothing without the life-changing power of the word of God. We don't want to be noticed by men. We only want to be noticed by God. Our mission is to show the world, to show them Jesus, not show them up with Jesus. Let me say that again. Our job is to show the world Jesus, not to show them up with Jesus. And sorrowfully, that's what happens sometimes, is we show off Jesus instead of showing up for him and just being his love in this world. Isaiah tells us the true purpose of having the Word in us. I have this above my, I have a computer desk at home where I do all of my studying. My computer is here, my books and my notebooks. And right above here, right bef- there's a lamp up here, right, right up here is the scripture out of Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. I look at it every day. I live, try to live by this every day. It is a verse that God gave me that is my purpose, um, my, the, the, that I strive for. It's the purpose I want to live in this world. And it says this, The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. I don't have the, my own instructed tongue. The Sovereign Lord gave me the tongue that I have to teach you today. That's not Jenny Fister. That's Jesus Christ. The Lord, the Sovereign Lord, has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary ones. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. Isaiah 50 verse 4. I want to have the word, I want to know the word that sustains the weary. That's what God wants for us. When we have the word on our hands or on our foreheads or in our hearts or on our souls, whether we have it on our adorned around our necks or in our mouths, whether we have it passed on to our children or on the doorposts, God says, here's the purpose that I want you to have the word. Yes, it will help you. Yes, the word is powerful and active and it will change your life by having the word. But when you have the word and you hide the word, we can have that promise and truth to give away to someone who is weary. We have the life-sustaining, life-changing word that can sustain the weary one. Isn't that what we want? I look at this weary world, tired and sorrowful and dark, and we have the life breathed word in us to give away to someone who's weary. That is the noblest call. And that's why we need to be phylactery factories. I want to manufacture word in my life over and over and over again. I want to be, and I encourage you to be, a phylactery factory. Um, I want to share uh, some upcoming things that Brushstroke is going to be doing. Um, if you don't know, uh, we have a ministry called Brushstroke Ministries. It's a threefold ministry of Bible study, worship, uh, and prayer. And we have four books, four devotional books that will be um, out the middle of last of June, the first of July. And they're called In Moments Like These. And each one has a series of words, praise, strife, sorrow, joy, peace, abandonment, um, strife. 
And then each one of those words has a little devotion that goes along with it. Instead of trying to find a devotional that'll speak, you know, you go go through, go through, go through devotion to try to find one that'll speak to you. This is set up that you can just find a word and open the bo- open that book, and there'll be a devotional there to minister to you in that moment, in that moment of strife, or that moment of of sorrow, or that moment of crisis, or abandonment, or a, a peace, or joy, a great moment. They're called in moments like these. Um, I'm very excited about them. We have worked really hard on them. There'll be four volumes, uh, volumes two through five. One of them is a volume about special days and holidays that has um, different holidays or special days like Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, Thanksgiving, even things like 9-11 and April Fool's Day. I'm going to be teaching over the next few weeks out of those books just to give you an an opportunity to uh, let that saturate you and sink into your spirit. We are very excited at Brushstroke Ministries because God is opening up amazing doors for us. Um, Being on uh, having two TV shows, having four books, having teaching CDs, God is just opening the world for us. And we're excited to be able to share that word because we know we have the word to give this weary place. So I just want to thank you for watching. I hope that this spoke to your heart. And I just want to remind you that God is painting a beautiful picture of your life with His, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you.